Communications Satellite A communications satellite is an artificial satellite that relays and amplifies radio telecommunications signals via transponder. It creates a communication channel between a source transmitter and a receiver at different locations on Earth. Communications satellites are used for television, telephone, radio, internet, and military applications. There are over 2,000 communications satellites in Earth's orbit, used by both private and government organizations. Many are in geostationary orbit above the equator, so that the satellite appears stationary at the same point in the sky, so the satellite dish antennas of ground stations can be aimed permanently at that spot and do not have to move to track it. The high frequency radio waves used for telecommunications links travel by line of sight and so are obstructed by the curve of the Earth. The purpose of communications satellites is to relay the signal around the curve of the Earth, allowing communication between widely separated geographical points. Communications satellites use a wide range of radio and microwave frequencies. To avoid signal interference, international organizations have regulations for which frequency ranges or bands certain organizations are allowed to use. This allocation of bands minimizes the risk of signal interference. The concept of the geostationary communications satellite was first proposed by Arthur C. Clarke, along with Vahid K. Sinati building on work by Konstantin Tsiolkovsky. In October 1945 Clarke published an article titled Extraterrestrial Relays in the British magazine Wireless World. The article described the fundamentals behind the deployment of artificial satellites in geostationary orbits for the purpose of relaying radio signals. Thus, Arthur C. Clarke is often quoted as being the inventor of the communications satellite and the term Clarke Belt employed as a description of the orbit. Decades later a project named Communication Moon Relay was a telecommunication project carried out by the United States Navy. Its objective was to develop a secure and reliable method of wireless communication by using the moon as a passive reflector and natural communication satellite. The first artificial Earth satellite was Sputnik 1. Put into orbit by the Soviet Union on October 4, 1957. It was equipped with an onboard radio transmitter that worked on two frequencies, 20.005 and 40.002 MHz. Sputnik 1 was launched as a major step in the exploration of space and rocket development. However, it was not placed in orbit for the purpose of sending data from one point on Earth to another. The first satellite to relay communications was Pioneer 1, an intended lunar probe. Though the spacecraft only made it about halfway to the moon, it flew high enough to carry out the proof-of-concept relay of telemetry across the world, first from Cape Canaveral to Manchester, England, then from Hawaii Cape Canaveral, and finally, across the world from Hawaii to Manchester. The first satellite purpose-built to relay communications was NASA's Project SCORE in 1958, which used a tape recorder to store and forward voice messages. It was used to send a Christmas greeting to the world from U.S. President Dwight D. Eisenhower. Courier 1B, built by Philco, launched in 1960, was the world's first active repeater satellite. The first artificial satellite used solely to further advances in global communications was a balloon named Echo 1. ECHO-1 was the world's first artificial communications satellite capable of relaying signals to other points on Earth. It soared above the planet after its August 12, 1960 launch, yet relied on humanity's oldest flight technology, ballooning. Launched by NASA, ECHO-1 was a luminized PET film balloon that served as a passive reflector for radio communications. The world's first inflatable satellite, or Saturn, as they were informally known, helped lay the foundation of today's satellite communications. The idea behind a communications satellite is simple, send data up into space and beam it back down to another spot on the globe. Echo 1 accomplished this by essentially serving as an enormous mirror, 10 stories tall, that could be used to reflect communications signals. There are two major classes of communications satellites, passive and active. Passive satellites only reflect the signal coming from the source, toward the direction of the receiver. With passive satellites, the reflected signal is not amplified at the satellite, and only a very small amount of the transmitted energy actually reaches the receiver. Since the satellite is so far above Earth, the radio signal is attenuated due to free space path loss, so the signal received in Earth is very, very weak. Active satellites, on the other hand, amplify the received signal before retransmitting it to the receiver on the ground. Passive satellites were the first communications satellites but are little used now. Telstar was the second active, direct relay communications satellite. Belonging to AT&T as part of a multinational agreement between AT&T, 
Bell Telephone Laboratories, NASA, the British General Post Office, and the French National PTT to develop satellite communications. It was launched by NASA from Cape Canaveral on July 10, 1962, in the first privately sponsored space launch. Relay 1 was launched on December 13, 1962, and it became the first satellite to transmit across the Pacific Ocean on November 22, 1963. An immediate antecedent of the geostationary satellites was the Hughes Aircraft Company's Syncom 2, launched on July 26, 1963. Syncom 2 was the first communications satellite in a geosynchronous orbit. It revolved around the Earth once per day at constant speed, but because it still had north south motion, special equipment was needed to track it. Its successor, Syncom 3, was the first geostationary communications satellite. Syncom 3 obtained a geosynchronous orbit without a north-south motion, making it appear from the ground as a stationary object in the sky. Beginning with the Mars Exploration Rovers, landers on the surface of Mars have used orbiting spacecraft as communications satellites for relaying their data to Earth. The landers use UHF transmitters to send their data to the orbiters, which then relay the data to Earth using either X-band or Ka-band frequencies. These higher frequencies, along with more powerful transmitters and larger antennas, permit the orbiters to send the data much faster than the landers could manage transmitting directly to Earth, which conserves valuable time on the NASA Deep Space Network. Communications satellites usually have one of three primary types of orbit, while other orbital classifications are used to further specify orbital details. As satellites in Mayu and Leo orbit the Earth faster, they do not remain visible in the sky to a fixed point on Earth continually like a geostationary satellite but appear to a ground observer to cross the sky and set when they go behind the Earth. Therefore, to provide continuous communications capability with these lower orbits requires a larger number of satellites, so one will always be in the sky for transmission of communication signals. However, due to their relatively small distance to the Earth their signals are stronger. A low Earth orbit typically is a circular orbit about above the Earth's surface and, correspondingly, a period of about 90 minutes. Because of their low altitude, these satellites are only visible from within a radius of roughly from the subsatellite point. In addition, satellites in low Earth orbit change their position relative to the ground position quickly. So even for local applications, a large number of satellites are needed if the mission requires uninterrupted connectivity. Low Earth orbiting satellites are less expensive to launch into orbit than geostationary satellites and, due to proximity to the ground, do not require as high signal strength. Thus there is a trade-off between the number of satellites and their cost. In addition, there are important differences in the onboard and ground equipment needed to support the two types of missions. A group of satellites working in concert is known as a satellite constellation. Two such constellations, intended to provide satellite phone services, primarily to remote areas, are the Iridium and Global Star Systems. The Iridium system has 66 satellites. It is also possible to offer discontinuous coverage using a low-Earth orbit satellite capable of storing data received while passing over one part of Earth and transmitting it later while passing over another part. This will be the case with the Cascade system of Canada's Cassiope Communications Satellite. Another system using this store and forward method is OrbKim. AMEU is a satellite in orbit somewhere between above the Earth's surface. MEU satellites are similar to LEO satellites in functionality. MEU satellites are visible for much longer periods of time than LEO satellites, usually between 2 and 8 hours. MEU satellites have a larger coverage area than LEO satellites. A MEU satellite's longer duration of visibility and wider footprint means fewer satellites are needed in a MEU network than a LEO network. One disadvantage is that a MEU satellite's distance gives it a longer time delay and weaker signal than a LEO satellite although these limitations are not as severe as those of a geosatellite. Like LEOs, these satellites don't maintain a stationary distance from the Earth. This is in contrast to the geostationary orbit, where satellites are always approximately from the Earth. Typically the orbit of a medium Earth orbit satellite is about above Earth. In various patterns, these satellites make the trip around Earth in anywhere from 2 to 8 hours. In 1962, the first communications satellite, Telstar, was launched. It was a medium-Earth orbit satellite designed to help facilitate high-speed telephone signals. Although it was the first practical way to transmit signals over the horizon, its major drawback was soon realized. Because its orbital period of about 2.5 hours did not match the Earth's rotational period of 24 hours, 
continuous coverage was impossible. It was apparent that multiple Mayus needed to be used in order to provide continuous coverage. To an observer on the Earth, a satellite in a geostationary orbit appears motionless, in a fixed position in the sky. This is because it revolves around the Earth at the Earth's own angular velocity. A geostationary orbit is useful for communications because ground antennas can be aimed at the satellite without their having to track the satellite's motion. This is relatively inexpensive. In applications that require a large number of ground antennas, such as direct TV distribution, the savings in ground equipment can more than outweigh the cost and complexity of placing a satellite into orbit. By 2000, Hughes Space and Communications had built nearly 40% of the more than 100 satellites in service worldwide. Other major satellite manufacturers include Space Systems slash Laurel, Orbital Sciences Corporation with the Star Bus Series, Indian Space Research Organization, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, Alcatel Space, Nauth Ailey Zelenia Space, with the Space Bus Series, and Astrium. Geostationary satellites must operate above the equator and therefore appear lower on the horizon as the receiver gets farther from the equator. This will cause problems for extreme northerly latitudes, affecting connectivity and causing multipath interference. Thus, for areas close to the North Pole, a geostationary satellite may appear below the horizon. Therefore, Molnia orbit satellites have been launched, mainly in Russia, to alleviate this problem. Molnia orbits can be an appealing alternative in such cases. The Molnia orbit is highly inclined, guaranteeing good elevation over selected positions during northern portion of the orbit. The Molnia orbit is designed so that the satellite spends the great majority of its time over the far northern latitudes, during which its ground footprint moves only slightly. Its period is one half day, so that the satellite is available for operation over the targeted region for 6 to 9 hours every second revolution. In this way, a constellation of three Molnia satellites can provide uninterrupted coverage. The first satellite of the Molnia series was launched on April 23, 1965, and was used for experimental transmission of TV signals from a Moscow uplink station to downlink stations located in Siberia and the Russian Far East, in Norilsk, Khabarovsk, Magadan and Vladivostok. In November 1967 Soviet engineers created a unique system of national TV network of satellite television, called Orbita, that was based on Molnia satellites. In the United States, the National Polar Orbiting Operational Environmental Satellite System was established in 1994 to consolidate the polar satellite operations off NASA NOAA. MPOS manages a number of satellites for various purposes, for example, MESAT for Meteorological Satellite, UMETSAT for the European branch of the program, and METOP for Meteorological Operations. These orbits are sun-synchronous, meaning that they cross the equator at the same local time each day. For example, the satellites in the NPOES orbit will cross the equator, going from south to north, at times 1.30 p.m., 5.30 p.m., and 9.30 p.m. Communications satellites are usually composed of the following subsystems. The bandwidth available from a satellite depends upon the number of transponders provided by the satellite. Each service requires a different amount of bandwidth for transmission. This is typically known as link budgeting and a network simulator can be used to arrive at exact value. Allocating frequencies to satellite services is a complicated process which requires international coordination and planning. This is carried out under the auspices of the International Telecommunication Union. To facilitate frequency planning, the world is divided into three regions Region 1, Europe, Africa, what was formerly the Soviet Union, and Mongolia Region 2, North and South America and Greenland Region 3, Asia, Australia, and the Southwest Pacific. Within these regions, frequency bands are allocated to various satellite services, although a given service may be allocated different frequency bands in different regions. Some of the services provided by satellites are the first and historically most important application for communication satellites was an intercontinental long-distance telephony. The fixed public switch telephone network relays telephone calls from landline telephones to an earth station, where they are then transmitted to a geostationary satellite. The downlink follows an analogous path. Improvements in submarine communications cables through the use of fiber optics caused some declining the use of satellites for fixed telephony in the late 20th century. Satellite communications are still used in many applications today. Remote islands such as Ascension Island, St. Helena, 
Diego Garcia, and Easter Island, where no submarine cables are in service, need satellite telephones. There are also regions of some continents and countries where landline telecommunications are rare to non-existent, for example large regions of South America, Africa, Canada, China, Russia, and Australia. Satellite communications also provide connection to the edges of Antarctica and Greenland. Other land use for satellite phones are rigs at sea, a backup for hospitals, military, and recreation. Ships at sea, as well as planes, often use satellite phones. Satellite phone systems can be accomplished by a number of means. On a large scale, often there will be a local telephone system in an isolated area with a link to the telephone system in a mainland area. There are also services that will patch a radio signal to a telephone system. In this example, almost any type of satellite can be used. Satellite phones connect directly to a constellation of either geostationary or low Earth orbit satellites. Calls are then forwarded to a satellite teleport connected to the public switch telephone network. As television became the main market, its demand for simultaneous delivery of relatively few signals of large bandwidth to many receivers being a more precise match for the capabilities of geosynchronous comsats. Two satellite types are used for North American television and radio, direct broadcast satellite, and fixed service satellite. The definitions of FSS and DBS satellites outside of North America, especially in Europe, are a bit more ambiguous. Most satellites used for direct-to-home television in Europe have the same high power output as DBS-class satellites in North America, but use the same linear polarization as FSS-class satellites. Examples of these are the Astra, Utelsat, and Hotbird spacecraft in orbit over the European continent. Because of this, the terms FSS and DBS are more south throughout the North American continent, and are uncommon in Europe. Fixed service satellites use the C band, and the lower portions of the K band. They are normally used for broadcast feeds to and from television networks and local affiliate stations, as well as being used for distance learning B schools and universities, business television, video conferencing, and general commercial telecommunications. FSS satellites are also used to distribute national cable channels to cable television head ends. Free-to-air satellite TV channels are also usually distributed on FSS satellites in the K-band. The Intelsat Americas 5, Galaxy 10R and AMC3 satellites over North America provide a quite large amount of FTA channels on their K-band transponders. The American Dish Network DBS service has also recently utilized FSS technology as well for their programming packages requiring their Super Dish antenna due to Dish Network needing more capacity to carry local television stations for the FCC's must-carry regulations, and for more bandwidth to carry TV channels. A direct broadcast satellite is a communications satellite that transmits to small DBS satellite dishes. Direct broadcast satellites generally operate in the upper portion of the microwave K-band. DBS technology is used for DTH-oriented satellite services, such as Direct TV and Dish Network in the United States. Bell TV and Shaw Direct in Canada, Freesat and Sky in the UK, Ireland, and New Zealand and DSTV in South Africa. Operating at lower frequency and lower power than DBS, FSS satellites require a much larger dish for reception and diameter for K-band, and 12 feet or larger for C-band. They use linear polarization for each of the transponders RF input and output, but this is a minor technical difference that users do not notice. FSS satellite technology was also originally used for DTH satellite TV from the late 1970s to the early 1990s in the United States in the form of TVRO receivers and dishes. It was also used in its K band form for the now defunct Prime Star satellite TV service. Some satellites have been launched that have transponders in the K band, such as DirecTV's Spaceway 1 satellite. And Onik F2. NASA and ISRO have also launched experimental satellites carrying K band beacons recently. Some manufacturers have also introduced special antennas for mobile reception of DBS television. Using global positioning system technology as a reference, these antennas automatically re-aim to the satellite no matter where or how the vehicle is situated. These mobile satellite antennas are popular with some recreational vehicle owners. Such mobile DBS antennas are also used by JetBlue Airways for direct TV, which passengers can view on board on LCD screens mounted in the seats. Satellite radio offers audio broadcast services in some countries, notably the United States. 
Mobile services allow listeners to roam a continent, listening to the same audio programming anywhere. A satellite radio or subscription radio is a digital radio signal that is broadcast by a communications satellite, which covers a much wider geographical range than terrestrial radio signals. Satellite radio offers a meaningful alternative to ground-based radio services in some countries, notably the United States. Mobile services, such as Sirius XM, and World Space, allow listeners to roam across an entire continent, listening to the same audio programming anywhere they go. Other services, such as Music Choice or Musax satellite delivered content, require a fixed location receiver and a dish antenna. In all cases, the antenna must have a clear view to the satellites. In areas where tall buildings, bridges, or even parking garages obscure the signal, repeaters can be placed to make the signal available to listeners. Initially available for broadcast to stationary TV receivers, by 2004 popular mobile direct broadcast applications made their appearance with the arrival of WO satellite radio systems in the United States, Sirius and XM satellite radio holdings. Later they merged to become the conglomerate Sirius XM. Radio services are usually provided by commercial ventures and are subscription-based. The various services are proprietary signals, requiring specialized hardware for decoding and playback. Providers usually carry a variety of news, weather, sports, and music channels, with the music channels generally being commercial-free. In areas with a relatively high population density, it is easier and less expensive to reach the bulk of the population with terrestrial broadcasts. Thus in the UK and some other countries, the contemporary evolution of radio services is focused on digital audio broadcasting services or HD radio, rather than satellite radio. Amateur radio operators have access to amateur satellites, which have been designed specifically to carry amateur radio traffic. Most such satellites operate as spaceborne repeaters, and are generally accessed by amateurs equipped with UHF or VHF radio equipment and highly directional antennas such as Yagi's or DISH antennas. Due to launch costs, most current amateur satellites are launched into fairly low Earth orbits, and are designed to deal with only a limited number of brief contacts at any given time. Some satellites also provide data forwarding services using the X.25 or similar protocols. After the 1990s, satellite communication technology has been used as a means to connect to the Internet via broadband data connections. This can be very useful for users who are located in remote areas and cannot access a broadband connection or require high availability of services. Communications satellites are used for military communications applications, such as global command and control systems. Examples of military systems that use communication satellites are the MILSTAR, the DSCS, and the FLSATCOM of the United States, NATO satellites, United Kingdom satellites, and satellites of the former Soviet Union. India has launched its first military communication satellite Sat 7, its transponders operate in UHF, F, C, and bands. Typically military satellites operate in the UHF, SHF or EHF frequency bands. Thanks for watching. Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.